Hi everybody, thank you for coming to my channel. Let us reason together. I will continue about the deity of Christ. So, uh, I ask a question sometimes people ask, or did ask actually, and it says, oh, the question was this, why did Jesus always say, fairly, fairly, I say unto you, instead of, thus says the Lord, in, as the Old Testament prophet did? Pretty good question, isn't it? So, Jesus' teaching were always presented as being ultimately or ultimate and final. He never wavered in this. He unflinchingly placed his teaching above those of Moses and the prophets. And in a uh, Jewish culture at that, he always spoke in his own authority. He never says, thus says the Lord, as did the prophet. He always says, fairly, fairly, I say unto you. He never retracts anything he said, never guessed or spoke with uncertainty, never made revisions, never contradicts himself, and never apologized for what he said. He even asserted that heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. You can read it also in Mark 13, 31. Hence, elevating his words directly to the realm of heaven. You know, I like to insert something like this too when you look at uh, uh, Matthew 4, 4 where he says, Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Wow! And then he says again, you know, also, also in Matthew 24, 25, he says, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will stay forever. He repeated it again. And beside that, <clears throat> uh, Matthew 4, 4 is actually what they call in the perfect tense. That means something happened in the past is complete, completed, and is in a future tense. It's, it's, it's right now going on. That's what it, meant. That's what it means, okay? So, Jesus' teaching has a profound effect on people. His listeners always seem to surmise that these were not the words of an ordinary man. When Jesus taught in Capernaum on the Sabbath, the people were amazed as at his teaching because his message had authority. You can also look at it in Luke 4.32. After the Sermon on the Mount, the crowd were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as the teachers of the law, Matthew 7, 28 and 29. When some Jewish leader asked the temple guards why they hadn't arrested Jesus when he spoke, they responded, no one ever spoke the way this man does. You can read it also in John 7, 46. One cannot read the gospel long before recognizing that Jesus regarded himself and his message as inseparable. The reason Jesus' teaching had ultimate authority was because he was or is God. The words of Jesus were the very words of God. Now they ask the question, you know, uh, was Jesus really claiming deity when he said that he and the Father are one? You can read it in John 10, 30. While the Greek word for one, hen, H-E-N, by itself does not have to refer to more than unity of purpose, the context of John 10 is clear that much more than this is meant 
in terms of Jesus and the Father. How do we know this? For one thing, the Jewish leaders immediately pick up stones to put Jesus to death. They understood Jesus to be claiming to be God in an unqualified sense. Indeed, according to verse 33, the Jews said, For good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, and because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. Okay? So, the penalty for blasphemy, according to the Old Testament law, is death by stoning. Beautiful. What an illustration, you know, God just, I mean, God Christ act. Jesus didn't respond by saying, oh no, you got it all wrong. I wasn't claiming to be God. I was just claiming to have a unity of purpose. Even the Jews claims to have a unity of purpose with God. They wouldn't have tried to stone Jesus for that. They understood Jesus as he intended to be understood. They understood him to be claiming deity. Wow! Beautiful! God's word is so beautiful, folks, I tell you. I got so excited, you know, because the Bible really show you the true God. Not the phony God, the true God. A God you can trust. A God who show His love, but also His law. Because He has to, otherwise He's not a righteous man, or a righteous God, excuse me. So it's so important, you know, to know the difference. So, some cultists, you know, say we shouldn't worship Jesus. What does the scripture say about this? Now here goes another point how beautiful it is, okay? Jesus Christ was worshipped. The Greek word is proskunio. As God many times according to the gospel account. And he always accepted such worship as perfectly appropriate. Jesus accepted worship from Thomas, remember? In John 20 to, uh, 28. Oh my God, oh my Lord, and right? The angels in Hebrews 1, 6. Some wise men. Matthew 2, 11. A leopard. Matthew 8, 2. A ruler. Matthew 9, 18. A blind man in John 9, 38. And an anonymous woman in Matthew 15, 25. Mary Madeline in Matthew 28, 9. And the disciples in Matthew 28, 17. All these verses contain the word proscunio, the same word used of worshiping the Father in the New Testament. Not to draw a contrast, consider that when Paul and Barnabas were in Lystra and miraculously healed a man by God's mighty power, those in the crowd shouted, The gods have come down to us in human form. Acts 14.11 When Paul and Barnabas perceived that the people were preparing to worship them, they tore their clothes and rushed out to the crowd shouting, Men, why are you doing this? We too are only men, human, humans like you. We are bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God, who made heaven and earth and sea, and everything in it. You can read it again, okay, in Acts also 14, 15. As soon as, as they perceived what was happening, they immediately corrected the gross uh, misconception that they were gods. Wow! 
And you know, many religions believe, especially also the Mormons, they believe that they can be a god and that they will live on a planet with wives and having, quote, quote, sex, 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 having, making children. That's what they believe. And they live for it. Unlike Paul and Barnabas, Jesus never sought to correct his followers when they bowed down and worship him. Indeed, Jesus considered such worship perfectly appropriate. Of course, we wouldn't expect Jesus to try to correct people in worshiping him if he truly was God in the flesh, as he claimed to be. In keeping with this, it is highly revealing that in the book of Revelation, God the Father, you can read it in Revelation 4.10, and Jesus Christ in 5.11-14 are portrayed as receiving the exact same worship. It's the same, exactly. The fact that Jesus willingly received and condoned worship on various occasions says a lot about his true identity. For it is the consistent testimony of Scripture that only God can be worshipped. You can read it also in Exodus 34, 14. It tells us, Do not worship any other God for the Lord whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Deuteronomy 6.13 and Matthew 4.10 in, in view of this, the fact that Jesus was worshipped on numerous occasions shows that he is in fact God. Now, coming up, another good hard point, hard, m difficult thing to explain, and sometimes, even I, you know, some don't quite understand, and yet I have to accept the scripture as what it says. The question is this, is there reference to Jesus as the Son of God in the Old Testament? In Proverbs 30, and 30, was authorized by a man named Augur, in the first four verses, of this chapter, Augur reflects on man's inability to comprehend the infinite God. Because of his inability, Augur abased himself and humbly acknowledged his ignorance. Agur, Agur, as I think Agur, effectively communicates the idea that reverence for God is the beginning of true wisdom. In verse 4, eager reflection are couched in terms of a series of questions. He asks, How has gone, who has gone up to heaven and come down? Who has gathered up the wind in the hollow of his hands, who has wrapped up the waters in his cloak? Wow, what a question. Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name and the name of his son? Tell me if you know. Beautiful. Even he asked those questions. Men is called conceit that the likelihood of this being an Old Testament reference to the first and second person of the Trinity, the Eternal Father and the Eternal Son of God. And it's highly significant that this portion of Scripture is not predictive prophecy, speaking about a future Son of God, rather it speak of the Father and the Son of God in present tense term during Old Testament times, exercising sovereign control over the world. They asked the question also, well, was Melchizedek 
a pre-incarnation appearance of Christ in the Old Testament? Well, I don't think so. Melchizedek is described in Scripture as being like, like. You hear me what it says? Like the Son of God. Not as being the Son of God himself. You can read it in Hebrews 7, 3. A lot of people don't, they'll make a mistake, you know. It seems best to view Melchizedek as an actual historical person, a mere human being, who was a type of Christ, a type in someone or something that prophetically foreshadows someone or something else. The reason some Old Testament persons or things foreshadow someone or something in the New Testament is that God planned it that way. In the repertory process, God in his sovereignty so arranged the outworking of history that certain individuals, things, events, ceremonies, and institutions foreshadow Christ in his person or ministry. This, I believe, is the case with Melchizedek. Those who argue that Melchizedek was not just a type of Christ, but was actually a pre-incarnated appearance of Christ, usually cited Hebrews 7.3 in support of this view. Without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life, like the Son of God, he remains a priest forever. No human being, it is argued, can be without father or mother, without genealogy, or without beginning of days or end of life. In response, many scholars argue that this verse simply means that the Old Testament was not recorded of these events. Old Testament scholars uh, Gleason noted that the context makes clear that Melchizedek was brought on the scene as a type of Messiah, the Lord Jesus. In order to bring out this typical character of Melchizedek, the Bible record purposely omits all mention of his birth, parents, or ancestors. This is not to say that Melchizedek has no father or mother. Rather, this verse simply means that none of those items of information was included in the Genesis 14 account and that they were purposely omitted in order to lay the stress on the divine nature and imperishable belief of the Messiah, the antitype. Ent oh, Excuse me. In what way was Melchizedek a type of Christ? Melchizedek's name is made up of two words, meaning king and righteous. Melchizedek was also a priest. Thus Melchizedek foreshadowed Christ as a righteous king, priest. Melchizedek was also the king of Salem which means peace. This point forwards to Christ as King of Peace. Now we come to a question, the Old Testament told you, what is Theophany? Theophany? Wow! The, the, the word Theophany comes from two Greek words, Theos, God, and peno, pheno, to appear. We might define the theophany as an appearance or manifestation of God, usually in visible 
bodily form. I believe that theophany in the Old Testament were actually pre-incarnated appearance of Christ. The principal theophany of the Old Testament is the angel of the Lord or angel of Yahweh. Okay, so I'm going to talk more about this in my next uh, video about the angel of the Lord who appear who appeared throughout the Old Testament actually is a pre-incarnated appearance of Christ and that's going to be a little bit tricky okay because certain scriptures um, make it a little hard sometimes to comprehend and you have to be very careful that you don't mix things up and yet I'm excited because this is a pretty hard complex I would say sometimes to ex explain in the scriptures because you know the Old Testament sometimes say certain things and it's hard the culture and the expression they use and and you know and other things involved you know that sometimes we in our time is modern time so to speak is, is, is a little hard to comprehend yet the scripture are so beautifully explained if you carefully read it step by step and the Holy Spirit will reveal to you when you understand it and you get the handle of it you get so excited because you can understand that even in the Old Testament quote quote if I may use the term okay in the New Testament Christ came in as an incarnated okay as a man as a human being but in the Old Testament is a little different like it says theophany right remember what that means theos God and phaino to appear God appear wow it's good to know okay some Greek words the meaning of it and bring it over to the English word so we have better understanding of that word when you read those things in the Old Testament I mean I get excited that even Christ did it to show the Jewish people who he is so folks I would say thank you again for stopping by if you have gotten anything out of my videos please give it a thumb up I see that before but it's good and if you like to su subscribe you know please the, ring the uh, notification bell and I will say then until next time it's going to be a good one a little hard one that took me a while to understand this but I like to share it with you and I will say until next time God bless you thank you